Welcome to the APL Quest. See APL Wiki for details. Today we're going to compute the Fibonacci sequence. Note that we're computing the first first n uh, elements of the sequence and not the nth uh, element, which is a more usual task. So the Fibonacci sequence is usually defined as being recursive. The way it's defined is that we start off with some seed values and then we compute the next value by summing the last two values in the sequence. We can express this as with a stopping condition. So if, if we start off the sequence with 0 and 1 uh, for the Fibonacci sequence and uh, that in that case we uh, say that for the zero, for the first um zero elements we just we, we don't need anything at all um we can just return zero um and for the uh, element number one uh, which we want a one and when we sum them together we get the zero and the one and that gives us a one and then one and one gives two and so on so uh if uh, the argument is less than or equal to 1, that means it's 0, 1, uh, then we can return the element uh, itself. Otherwise, we want the sum of the function itself applied to uh, each one of the argument minus 1 and 2. So we can try this on, uh, on 1, 2, 3, and so on. But we don't want uh, the nth element, we want uh, all the elements up to n, so we can apply this on each of, n of the numbers here. And th while this works, um, it, you, it is exceedingly inefficient. Not only do we uh, compute the same sequence over and over again for n minus 1 and n minus 2, uh, for every element of the sequence, we're also doing this whole thing over and over again. And this uh, becomes ridiculously slow uh, very quickly. So that's not a good uh, way to do it, but it very clearly expresses what the sequence is about. Instead, uh, we're going to focus on computing the entire sequence at once. And the way we're going to do that is by using a fundam what I call a fundamental Fibonacci transformation function. Let's call that delta. The fundamental function is that we are extending the current se generated sequence with one more element by summing the last two elements of the current sequence. So the current sequence concatenated to the sum of the last two elements taken from uh, the current sequence. And so, if we start by applying this uh, to, we can do it to a 1, because taking the last two elements will give you a, a 0 and a 1. Um, and then we can apply it over and over again. So, how can we actually use this, and how can we define things in terms of uh, this function? Well, now we can uh, write a um, recursive function where we are looking at the element uh, at the argument if it's less than or equal to 1 then we know exactly what the sequence is going to be if it's 0 it's going to be the empty numeric vector if it's 1 it's going to be a vector uh, 1 and so we can transform a 1 into a vector 1 and 0 into a 0 element vector simply by letting the argument reshape itself and then uh, and we want to extend the sequence otherwise. And what sequence are we going to extend? We're going to extend the sequence that we got for uh, one less than the current number we're at. And then we just need to extend it. So let's call this a recursive version. And this works, but it has one problem. And that uh, approaches the field of tail-call optimization. Tail call optimization is a method where uh, we do not need to keep track of uh, the caller when we are recursing um, by not having to build up a stack because the final result value is not going to be 
post-processed in any way. And the problem that we have up here is that after we're recursing, we're taking the result value and modifying it. Essentially, we're building up a, um, a sequence on the stack, which is just waiting for a value that can be extended more and more. And we really should try to avoid that, both for um, efficiency and not to run out of stack space either. Um, so if if the interpreter, and this one is, uh, is till call optimized, uh, then it will detect that we're not using uh, the result, just returning it. Um, and then it will not build up a new stack frame, it will just replace the old stack frame with a new one. Um, and for that, uh, we're going to, we want to know when to stop rather than just returning a value which is then used. And the way we know how to stop is when we've generated enough of the sequence, meaning when the generated sequence is long enough. So we'll feed every iteration of this function, uh, the stop condition in the form of a length, how long we need to, uh, to make it. And that's going to be an, a left argument. And that left argument then is, is given in the initial call. So our argument 10 means we want to keep going until we've got 10. Of course, we can't make a function that just takes a left argument. So we'll use as right argument the seed value and that we're going this, the beginning sequence that we're going to start with. So if the cutoff point um, is um, less than or equal to the length of the currently generated sequence, then we're either done or beyond done. And so uh, we would, in principle, just return the sequence, but the problem is it might have been too long, and it only really happens if. Uh, the argument is zero and we begin with a seed value of of a one then we need to chop it down just like uh, we did before so we can do uh, a, a take which just caps uh, the sequence to the correct length and now um, since we know we're not done yet then it's safe to just extend the sequence and then we need to check again. That means we need to recurse. And the limit for how, for the sequence length is still going to be the same. So we feed that along to the next iteration. And here we can see that the last call is, go, is the recursive call with a left argument, but the result isn't being used a, for further computation. Therefore, this is tail call optimized. Then we just need to start off with the seed, which is a one, doesn't matter, it's a scalar, because we're going to do the take on it, so it's going to become a vector anyway, and we're going to extend it in other, all other cases. So this is the tail call optimized version. There we go. Um, another way we could uh, see this use of the fundamental function is by applying multiple times. And we can express this uh, using the power operator. So if we use the power operator with a number on some seed, then we're going to extend it. Problem is we're just generating a little bit too much, um, but we can use take again to chop it down. We don't want to start with zero, 1 either, because then we get a zero at the beginning. So we can express this uh, just by using argument over here. So this is using uh, the power operator and be with two beginning values, so we're pending to the first two. Oops. There we go. It's a bit... It feels a bit silly to make the sequence longer than it needs to be. And we only do that because we're starting off with a seed value of 1, 1. Problem is, uh, if we were to start with an empty sequence and append to that, uh, then when we try to, try to take the last two elements we'll be of an empty vector, we'll be padding with zeros, and that's going to be uh, zero, uh, 0, 0, sum together, 0, and we add a 0, and the sequence will stay 0 forever. So how can we ensure that we always get at least 1? 
Well, we can do that by a clamping to be above 1 or doing a max with a 1. So, um, if we start with empty sequence and then we apply the ba basic transformation function on that n times, we max with a1. We need to bind these together. So essentially here what's happening is the power operator is applying max over and over again, always with a constant 1 as left argument. But right before it applies it in the next the next time, it pre-processes the right argument with the fundamental extension function, which just so then adds one more element to the sequence. And that does the job. So this is appending to the first zero elements. Oops. Same mistake. There we go. So that's another way to do it. Another way we can uh, iterate is using reduction. And uh, there's a bit of a trick here going on. If we look at uh, at our definition of delta, it's a defin, and it it doesn't have an alpha in there, so it doesn't use the left argument. Doesn't mean we can't give it a left argument. That works perfectly fine. Therefore, uh, we can start off with our um, with a sequence and then we can apply with some random value here it doesn't actually matter and this is a reduction we have a sequence 42 42 1 in this case but these all these values except for the last one don't matter because only the right uh, right side is going to be used as our seed value and then we're just inserting uh, this delta in between them. So we just need to generate a sequence that um, ends with a1. doesn't matter what it is. We might as well just use um, all ones for that. And then we can reduce using delta. And that gives us this. Um, notice that it's enclosed in because reduction has to reduce the rank from uh, one vector to zero scalar so it encloses that but we can just uh, disclose that and go back so this is a very short way um, of defining it uh, using a reduction there is one problem however and that is if we try to run this on zero so zero reshape one that's an empty vector and then we're trying to reduce over an empty vector right Re that requires that the operand ha uh, has a known identity element we don't have that because it's a user-defined function, and in fact, uh, there isn't one anyway. Um, so we can't do that. We have to extend the sequence by one, and then remove one element again. And it'll be a little bit ugly to do that, but it can be done. So instead of using omega to reshape uh, the one, let's use one plus. Uh, or uh, one max an uh, omega. That just make, means that if you have zero, it becomes one. All the other numbers stay the same. And then finally, we'll have too many elements just in that case of zero. But we can fix that as we've done uh, before by just taking the first n element. So in most cases, it's not go it's going to be a no up, but just for zero, it's going to chop the one down to a zero. And now that works, and it works. Uh, still for larger numbers as well. Okay, that's it for using this fundamental uh, Fibonacci extension function, but there are other ways to compute it. And um, one is by using a pairwise sum. So a pairwise sum is, is we can see how it's related to what we're doing because we want to add the last two elements in order to build up the next um, next element. But we want to extend the sequence, not shorten it down. And a pairwise sum, uh, that's an n-wise reduce with, with n being 2, uh, it always remove, uh, reduces the length of the argument by 1 because it's taking two adjacent elements and combi combining them into 1. So we need to extend, we need to pad with uh, additional uh, numbers. 
So that means we could, uh, if we have a pairwise sum um, of 0 and 1, that gives us the next element, but we need to have uh, more elements added up. So if we, if we add more, and then we can use this again, um, so if we if we add more elements, so we need to to extend with one element every time around the loop, and we and pairs reduction re removes one, so we need to add two. So if we do this, oop, oh, hold on, this isn't working. Um, oh yeah, of course. The the problem is that we need to have more. We need to have more ones here. Uh, we need to make sure that the minimum value is a uh, is a one. So we can use the same trick as we did before with um, with a max with one. So let's try that. Here, so now now we don't actually need any any start values anymore. And we can apply this. Again, and we can see how the sequence is building up. So we just need, and uh, we just need this transformation here to be applied and uh, over and over again. So we take the the sequence as far as we've built it up so far, um, put two more zeros on the left, pairwise reduction. Make sure that uh, we start off generating and uh, generating ones and we do that n times beginning with an empty sequence so this is a pairwise sum another way to compute uh, the Fibonacci sequence is by using a transformation matrix and um, that matrix it's a tiny little matrix looks like this and if we multiply that by itself and keep doing that, then if we look at the generated matrices along the way, we can spot the Fibonacci sequence in there. For example, in the top right corner, uh, we're going down one, one, two, three, five, eight, and so on. And so again, we have here M all over the place, and we have uh, matrix multiplications in and uh, in between them. This means uh, that we can define a um, a vector of M's. And then we can reduce those using the and matrix multiplication to get the tenth element. However, we want all the intermediary values. So instead of using reduction, we can use a scan. And then we just need to have uh, the top right element of each one. And that gives us uh, the Fibonacci sequence. If you try to use it on a zero, uh, it works fine because we have a uh, we have an empty vector with a known uh, with a reduction and with a known. So we can try this plus dot times reduction over an empty vector of uh, of matrices. It doesn't really matter what their values are. Uh, that doesn't work, uh, but a scan and uh, a scan just gives us the intermediary and uh, values beginning with the first one uh, preserved but when there aren't any there's nothing that needs to be done we don't need to curse on any value out we don't want need an identity element which would have been the identity matrix um anyway but it would have been relative to the argument and that hasn't um, been defined but this is using matrix multiplication um and we can we can hard code our vector in uh, our matrix inside here, so it's standalone. 
okay another way to do it is by the only information is remember the only information that we we need to compute the next value in the sequence are the last two elements um so what it means is that when we're going from the last the current last two elements to the next last two elements then the last elements become the last element becomes the first element and the sum of the two becomes the last element so consider here two and three let's say those are our last uh, last elements um, if we do a scan on those then uh, we preserve the first element and the second element becomes the sum of the two and that's very close to what we wanted we want to preserve the last element and then have the sum and we can do this simply by reversing the two so and uh, now the three became the first and the sum of two and three became the last which means we can, if we do this again, we get the next values. And then we can, we can, if we extract every time around the loop, the uh, one of the elements, uh, the first one, for example, then we can build up the sequence. We just need to store them somewhere. So we can define a function where we have a result variable we're not going to use it initially, but we're going to um, apply this transformation here, the plus scan on the reverse of the current pair. And then we want to uh, take the first element from that and uh, append that to the result variable. And then we want to uh, return the new, uh, the new pair, which is, which is this whole thing. So here's a trick. Instead of taking the first element, let's leave the whole thing, the whole, and when we do the concatenation to the result variable, we pre-process the new value that is being added to the result with first. But still, this whole function is the uh, modifying function in this uh, modified assignment. And the assignment is here, and there's a principle that the assignment always returns whatever is on the right. So even though we are only actually using the first value, the result of this whole assignment is going to be this whole pair, and that's the whole pair that we actually interested in. So now we can do this, and we want to do it n times, uh, and we just need a starting uh, pair, which is 0 and 1. So the first time, uh, so if we do this zero times, we have R already set to an empty vector. If we do it one time, then that means we are adding them uh, up. We're getting one, one, taking the first value, that's one, adding to that. Then the second time around the loop, we do one, one, um, adding up is two. So we get one, two, uh, we get another one, and, um, and so on. And once we've done that n times, then R has accumulated all the values that you want and we, we're not interested in the last pair which would be the result from um, from this application of the power operator we just want the resulting uh, value so that gives us our sequence uh, using um, accumulation and that's it for uh, all the methods that we're going to look at for building up the result slowly. We can actually compute the entire result in one go. And there are, uh, because it's possible to compute the nth Fibonacci number directly without building it up to it. And there are various ways uh, of doing so. And one way is by using approximations of the golden ratio. Um, so if we have a bunch of ones, so for this series, and then we can reduce using um, um, addition to the reciprocal. That gives so this gives us an approximation of uh, the golden ratio. If this value is large enough, then we get a very good value for the golden ratio. But as we get there, 
um, all the intermediary array values, which we can get with a scan, are uh, approximations. And these approximations are exactly ratios of two uh, adjacent elements in the Fibonacci series. So if they're fractions of the two adjacent elements, that means if you can get either uh, the numerator or the denominator, uh, then we can get uh, the sequence. And we can do that with the least common uh, divisor with uh, a 1. Although you can see here we're we are we're missing one. We want actually the other number in the pair. And we can just flip the, uh, the ratio upside down, uh, taking the the inverse or reciprocal of that and that gives us uh, the series directly computed however uh, we're both using a scan using a custom function here and we're using uh, a number theoretical function on floats it's so the performance is not going to be great it is neat looking though We can also use the sum of the binomial coefficients to compute the nth Fibonacci number. Um, the way it works is that uh, we start with the numbers from 1 to n minus 1. So, and then uh, we can give those a name and reverse them. And then we can pair them up with themselves in the normal order. So this pairs up 0 and 9, 1 and 8, and so on. And doing the binomial on that. And then we sum that. And that gives us the nth Fibonacci number uh, in this way. Notice that we have a uh, scalar function reduction over a scalar vector application. We can combine that to be an inner product. And we want the same argument on both sides. I goes on both sides. Um, we only want, just want to pre-process the right argument to this inner product with reverse. So that it can be stated uh, like this as well. And that means we can make this into a tacit function. Applied on 10 to get the 10th Fibonacci number. And we can therefore get uh, all the numbers up to 10 by applying on each on Iocha, just like we did in the very beginning with the recursive version. Of course, this is hugely inefficient, both because of the expensive uh, functions that we are using, uh, the binomial, and also because we are recomputing uh, over and over uh, for every number. But uh, it's kind of fun and short. So this is based on the coefficients. Um, and finally, we can use Binet's formula. It's rather long and involved, but it's not using any difficult math and it's all scalar functions and that has the benefit then that we can just compute the nth Fibonacci number directly on the whole sequence just by feeding it uh, the all the indices that we want. I'm going to type it up. Um, there's nothing really to explain other than this is a formula. You can look it up online. It can be stated in, in various ways uh, because of some equivalences, but it's not really important. And so we want that on the entire sequence. And that computes the sequence directly. Okay, on to uh, the finishing stage here, which is going to be performance comparison. Let's copy CMPX uh, from Deason's workspace. And then we need to build up um, all the expressions that we want to run. We can get all the functions that we have defined uh, like this. But there's actually a feature that maybe not so well known, uh, that Quadenel can take a list of, uh, of letters that it will then uh, filter its result with um, to only include functions that begin with any of those uh, of those letters. And notice here that all our solutions begin with an uppercase uh, letter. CMPX begins with a lowercase letter and delta isn't uh, a normal letter at all. So if you give it the uppercase English alphabet, that filters uh, out. And each one of them, well, we uh, we want to apply to some argument or arguments. 
and um, in order to get some balance in it, uh, should it be a, a large number, a small number? So let's apply to all the numbers up to uh, some limit. So we're applying it to uh, each one up to, say, um, IOTA 20. And we are doing that on each. So these are all the uh, expressions we're going to run. And then uh, CMPEX on that. And this might take a little while. So I might cut this out of the video. And there we go. Here's our result. And uh, we can see that uh, using Binet's formula to compute the values is the clear winner here. Um, and even though there's cute, the binomial coefficients is not going to uh, be able to compete with anything. Thank you for watching.